So you're chair ropes running for District 31. You currently are a state senator for District 31. Mm -hmm. um, for people who don't know everything about you, you know, if you want to share some information about where you live and your background, that would be good. Sure. Well, I'm Sharon Erickson Ropes, and I've been your senator for the last four years. I live in Winona. I'm a registered nurse, so I'm working primarily on health care issues and prevention, trying to keep people healthy where it's a lower cost to families and the state. I'm also a Navy veteran. I served for five years in the Navy, and right now I serve as the vice chair of the Senate Veterans Committee, and I'm really proud to say that this year I'm the number one senator in the state of Minnesota for carrying and passing veterans' bills. Um, I've been married to my husband for 31 years. I'm a lifelong Democrat, and he's a Republican. So um, I think uh, that really fits southeastern Minnesota very well. Um, I don't play political games. Because of that, I know my husband is not evil or ridiculous. And there's probably people in your own families that vote differently than you. And I'm really committed to uh, working across the aisle, getting along with people, and being respectful, no matter which party they're in, and as a way to move Minnesota forward. So. Uh, because of that, I've been the only Democrat selected to sit with the Republican at the same desk on the Senate floor. So all the Democrats sit in twos over here, Republicans share desks over here, and there's one left over of each party that have to share a desk. So um, I've been the, again, the only Democrat selected to sit with the Republican for the last four years. And um, so that's just a little bit about me. So, over the past uh, four years, what do you feel have been some focal points that you're, you know, that, that you have directed your energy at that are important for people in Fillmore County, the readers of the Fillmore County Journal, and anybody who goes on our website, which could be anybody. Right. Okay. Well, um, I've been very active in Winona County, Fillmore County, and Houston County. Um, in particular, the, one of the most recent projects I've been working on in Fillmore County is related to the Fillmore County Veterans Cemetery. That's been a project of mine I've been working on for the last um, almost two years. And we're moving forward with a possible location just outside of Preston. I think that'll bring a lot of visitors, economic development to the area, as well as um, some jobs. And it's always a good thing to honor our troops. So um, we'll continue to move that project forward. Um, I've also served as vice chair of the Senate Agriculture Committee, and southeastern Minnesota is heavily agricultural, of course. So we've been passing really good bills related to bovine tuberculosis and um, separating out the state into two uh, sections so we can continue to move cattle across the borders down here. I've also um, worked on uh, dairy loans and um, efforts to keep young farmers on the farms and deal with uh, the rising cost of health care for farming uh, families. Okay. Now, relating to uh, something that's been obviously a hot topic for the state of Minnesota in general is the state budget. Um, LGA funding, for example, is a huge issue in Fillmore County right. um, and probably most of rural Minnesota. Um, any population under a thousand uh, is, is concerned at where they're going to end up. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen you know, drastic cuts. Uh, we've done a number of stories on, in our paper. Where do you see your role in, in that process and what, what do you think uh, you can influence or what, what do you think needs to be done or what would you do to try to help uh, you know, the smaller communities that, you know, all of these communities, Preston, population 14, mm -hmm. 26, um, you know, Spring Valley, Chatfield, both both uh, sizable populations in between 2,000 and 2,500. Um, you know, what, what do you think uh, you can do to help uh, contend with that uh, from an LGA funding standpoint? Where would you uh, stand on that and how would you go to bat for that? Well, great question. And just to clarify for uh, listeners at home or on the internet, LGA is local government assistance. Um, that's some um, funding that the state gives to, at the county level and the city uh, government level to um, help with things like fire and police protection, uh, road plowing, uh, bridge and maintenance, bridge maintenance and those sorts of things. 
Um, I will continue doing what I've been doing the last four years, and that's really standing up for LGA. I understand how key that is to keeping um, local services going, um, keeping libraries open, keeping swimming pools open, making sure we have enough soap, snow plows on the streets to make sure that people are safe driving during the winter. These are really key uh, local services. Governor Pawlenty, in the last budget cycle, when we were dealing with a $3 billion deficit, targeted local government assistance uh, for four times the amounts of cuts we actually uh, agreed to. So he goes after LGA big time. He's trying to squeeze down the size of government. And I would say, knowing my small communities here, where some of these communities have one squad car and only a couple policemen on duty, I don't know where they can go to cut you know, with a public safety department like that. I mean, there is a bottom line to what small communities need to provide their citizens. So I fought real hard to restore um, three quarters of the funding back to LGA. So um, I'm proud of that. I'll continue to look at um, LGA and supporting that funding as we move forward. In the next budget year, as you know, we're looking at a $6 billion projected deficit. And my position on any cuts is that if they're going to be done, they have to be done fairly, and we have to base them on facts and data and have all parties working together. So with, you know, with that said, and you look at the amount of money that we're talking about, if LGA funding isn't cut, which is what happened, where else do you go? Where else do you look to say we've got to balance the budget and where can we, where can we, you know, it's either generate more revenue or, or cut expenses. Where do you think the state of Minnesota can manage their money differently? Well, so you're talking about how to solve the $6 billion projected deficit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, first we have to talk honestly about the budget and make sure that we're not playing political games with the numbers. Um, this is the second worst economy in Minnesota's history. So it feels bad because it is bad. And to be honest, it's going to be tough sledding for the next two years, three years, perhaps even four. So when I go out and I talk to the school boards and the cities and the counties, um, I ask them, do you want me to sugarcoat what's going on or do you want um, to deal with reality and what we're up against? As we're looking at how to solve that problem, um, one of my key values is fairness. And rather than targeting one group over another, um, I think we're going to have to ask all Minnesotans to be part of a shared solution. And this last year we were, as schools will tell you, and cities and counties, uh, there's no fat left, or there's very little <coughs> fat left. We're down to taking off fingers and cutting, you know, bone now. So um, what I've seen around the countryside here in southeastern Minnesota is, you know, we could probably trim up, we can always improve, I believe in constant improvement, but there's not a lot left um, to deal with. So we're just going to have to be very fair in how we approach the cuts. Um, we can't solve this budget hole or fill up the hole with cuts alone. Um, we're going to have to continue streamlining government, um, redesigning government the way we know it, and I'm carrying going to be carrying one of the major bills. I'm working with the Association of Minnesota Counties right now on a major redesign of government services. We're going to have to continue that. We're going to have to delay projects. We're going to have to um, really put some serious uh, uh, government reform and downsizing into place. This last session with just $3 billion deficit, um, the legislature that I was part of cut more than any legislature has in the history of Minnesota. So we're making dramatic cuts. We're downsizing government. We're going to have to continue to do that. The, the only thing I'm very concerned about is that we're doing it proportionately and we're doing it fairly. Um, relating to another subject that is kind of important, I think, to all of us here and all throughout the state of Minnesota is education. In particular, focusing on Fillmore County, which is probably not unique in, in comparison to Houston County. Probably a little bit different dynamic than what Winona County is, is contending with, but a point of contention among a lot of people in this area is open enrollment. Mm -hmm. 
when it was, you know, it was the design, the, the model that was uh, put forth probably didn't take into consideration that you'd have uh, schools, for example, in, I live in Fountain, population 343. Uh, in the city of Fountain, we have five school buses. Two from Chatfield, one rural, one city, one from Lansboro, one from Kingsland, and one from Fillmore Central. Fountain is in the Fillmore Central School District, but because of open enrollment, uh, we're... Kids leave the district. Yeah, we're, and, and actually 32, 33% of Lanesboro's entire student enrollment is open enrollment. Um, it's, it's just kind of a, an issue that seems to continually get overlooked. Um, but yet it adds up in real costs of transportation. And um, unfortunately, until something changes at a state level, it's going to continue to be the way it is. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people locally say, well, for open enrollment, why don't, you know, the parents who want to have their students go to a different school, why don't they, if they Provide want the transportation. E exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and oftentimes, the open enrollment programs are used in a way as a leverage point to say, well, uh, I know that you get state funding, I know that uh, my student is worth something to you, and uh, sometimes parents can even threaten to take their student to a different to a different school district knowing that mm -hmm. and uh, knowing that they're not going to have to pay any extra transportation costs. So, you know, that's an issue. In addition, we have a declining student um, enrollment. enrollment. Mm -hmm. I've done uh, a number of stories on it. As a matter of fact, uh, January 25th, 2009, or 2010, in our progress edition, I did a story on how our class size, for example, in Kingsland School District is projected to go from about 85 students to about half that by the year 2019. Collectively, six schools in Fillmore County will have barely over 200 students graduated from six different school districts with, uh, you know, superintendents, by uh, six different superintendents. Right. So, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of issues that will affect uh, funding for, you know, um, uh, education for kids in our schools, but also, you know, we're jockeying around deciding, well, where do we spend money on that building that needs to be fixed up? Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in particular, Fillmore Central has uh, elementary school in Preston and high school and middle school over in uh, Harmony, and there's a big debate there is it can end up in one town or the other for the entire school system. Mm -hmm. um, we just, long term, we don't have the big farm families that we used to have. We don't have the growing population. We've been kind of stagnant at, at uh, just around 21,000 population for decades. Mm -hmm. So from an education standpoint, um, we have very, very smart kids in our area. Our MCA testing They're proves above it. average. They are. Our MCA right. testing proves it. Um, Rushford is, is doing dynamite. Uh, their math and, and English scores, they're off, they're off the charts. Um, all the schools have some great things going for them. But I guess the question is going forward, you know, it seems like it seems like we're kind of kind of at the mercy of uh, some other decisions that have been made in the past. Open enrollment being one of them. What what can be done to change it? Because it is a real issue, and it and that open enrollment is bigger than dollars. It creates animosity between communities, huge, big time. People in one town uh, feel animosity towards people in another town because because they feel like they're stealing students and stealing dollars away from them. And the fact is, they're all our region's children. Mm -hmm. you know, so uh, I understand what you're saying. Well, you cover a lot of territory. I know, I know. Jason. I know. Kind of like a country school bus. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, let me start by first saying that I'm a former school board member myself mm -hmm. uh, from Winona. And the problems uh, that Winona faces aren't really that much different than Preston and Lanesboro and Spring Valley and Chatfield, some of the areas down here. We're all dealing with declining enrollment. We all deal with open enrollment. We're dealing with um, the high cost of health care for our staff and employees and um, unfunded uh, federal mandates, especially IDEA, that's the uh, special education mandate. Um, that was uh